Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be part of this stellar group of speakers. Something like this, though I was not after the same things that are shown in this animation, actually happened to me. So I'm going to tell you about this journey that I had, and which was initiated by a control all delete moment and my learning from it. So about a decade back, I consider myself quite healthy, and one day I found myself in excruciating pain, so much so that for the first time, luckily the only time, I ended up in an emergency room. And something unique was happening to me. I was in such intense pain that I became numb, but all my other senses were actually, um, they kind of crystallized and I was focused so much so, I felt like I was in a kind of here and now zone. Something was very placid and peaceful about that moment also. That was oddly familiar to me, but I could not point my finger at it. Um, later I realized that when I work in remote wilderness areas, I, despite all the insect bites and all the scratches and cuts and all the other issues one has to deal with, I do feel that placid, that kind of a fluid peacefulness. So I went back home and I was convalescing. I am, um, you know, lazy to the core. Anyway, my garden was never, a, you know, yard was never a gardener's uh, bride, but now I had an excuse and I let it go completely unkempt and it was wild. So now um, it was such a boon because I could, I had only this yard to really walk around. I didn't have, um, I was not allowed to go too much and drive around so much. So I had, you know, every now and then I found this wonderful weedy flowers and something without flowers but new to me. And more I looked, more I discovered this wonderful array of plants that was teeming with diversity. And many of the plants that were actually, that many of the medicines that were actually recommended to me, re nature medicine at this stage, I realized they were, they were actually growing around me. I only knew them in bottles and, you know, in pills and tablet forms. Here they were, they were around me. I was not going to, you know, plug them and make them medicines. You know, nature pathy has its own ways of, you know, how to harvest, how to prepare, and how to administer. But the very fact that they were growing around me kind of held me in a very, you know, reassuring way. And sort of, you know, sometimes you have an important meeting or an exam and somebody give you a blessing or a, you know, good wish card, and you can reach out for it in your pocket or just remember it and it gives you a fuzzy, warm feeling of support in that sort of ways. I was really touched by the presence of the weeds in the yard. And so, um, as, the journey, uh, as the journey continues, um, I realized that before all this had happened, I was I am standing, in my, standing in my values of oneness and equity. I really wanted to connect people to nature. Somehow I believe that if somehow we connect to nature and, it's, and the diversity is nurture, the decisions that we will take that, are stre that stream from that connection can actually address many of the issues that we have created from, no from being disconnected. So um, actually there is a conservationist, Don Herman, who had even highlighted when he wrote that nature and culture makes us, um, diversity in nature and culture makes us human. So coming back to the story, as I started, you know, studying more of this, knowing more I looked at the, uh, looked at my yard, more plants I discovered, more I got to know about them, and I learned a few things about them. I realized that um, I don't need to go elsewhere to connect to wilderness. Wilderness was happening around me. So much of our lives are locked in, you know, screens. And we have made, you know, we have made the choice and locked in our screens. But the life happens in the periphery. 
Just like that, in the peripheries of a yard, peripheries of our walkways, these wild and wilderness was actually volunteering as weeds. So what I learned about them, weeds are the language that soil and climate speaks to us. So um, there is a particular plant called Brihad Gokshura, Peralium murex. This plant will appear whenever the, so uh, the soil turns saline. Then there is another one called buttonweed, it, uh, or sperm spermacosi. This plant exists when the soil has been gone through heavy tillage or there's some construction. So by just looking at a yard, you say, hey, did you have a construction? You feel like you know, you're a little bit of a detective there. So it actually speaking to us if we care to listen. Then um, they are also, um, it reminded me, the weeds actually, um, uh, the one after observing, they reminded me that nature is more about collaboration than competition. Why? Because these are tough guys, you know. They don't need nurturing, they don't need too much of, um, too much of um, anything to grow, they grow their roots really deep. And when they grow their roots really deep, they bring out the nutrients that um, other plants that we plant are able to take it. So blue, one color blue, which is one of the most expensive dye that nature can produce. There are many more wild plants that are blue in color, if you now notice, um, are shades of blue. But when the plant actually invests in blue, they want to get the most out of this, that investment but by strategizing to synchronize their blooming. The most famous one of this is, of course, Strobilanthus kuntiana, or the Nila kurunji, or the kurunji, that blooms once in 12 years and paints the hill blue. That's why Western Ghats in Indian language is called Nilagiris or the Blue Mountains. But even if you are looking, look around your feet and find the tiny little flowers, if you find a blue flower, look around. You will definitely find a few, more, a few others. Blue attracts bees and other um, insect pollinators also, but it is meant for the bees primarily. When the bees come to visit, they don't only, you know, uh, uh, visit the, poly the flowers that are wild, they also visit the flowers of the plants that we plant. So the weed are the helpers. So if when, I, when you actually club a whole set of plants and call it weeds, it actually shows our own lack of knowledge about them and of course an attitude because they are clearly uh, marking them as unwanted. But I got to love them. I got, they're you know, egalitarian, they're present everywhere, they're accessible to everybody. Rich, poor, you know, far near, rural, urban, they're everywhere. What is not to like about them? And so much so that they're also packed with nutrients and macronutrients. This is when one third of the world is macronutrient deficient. And you know that eating them as incorporating them as part of the food is a way more efficient way than actually uh, you know, taking supplements or pills. So when, um, when all this were happening, I decided, um, let, me, let me study them a little more. And I noticed that they change. The, the weeds that are growing in my yard um, with a little bit of change of, of course, season, temperature, moisture, another set of weeds come in. So they're very sensitive, sensitive to these, um, you know, these um, triggers. One of the reasons science accepts them as a very good indicator of climate change. So how do you adapt to climate change, or any change for the matter? The best way would be to link to the change itself. So knowing about weeds somehow puts you in, in some kind of a knowledgeable state about, about um, as you go, um, as you encounter climate change and puts you in climate action. So, but even without climate change, it can act as a guide, guide for 
what plant to grow. This follows Masanobu Fukuoka's, um, you know, teaching on natural farming, um, which says, like, you know, see the natural plants in the, in growing naturally in your garden, and then maybe the cultivar varieties of the same will grow better in your garden. So this is true for, you know, there in, in this area and um, around, you find two cousins of grapes, Cesus quadrangularis and Cesus vitigenia. So Cesus quadrangularis is, you, many of you would know, it's called um, pirandai or uh, harjor. And uh, the other one, it's called jungli angur, or uh, I think it's called also tribal grape. It grows anywhere, but in Maharashtra area, it's actually very common, especially in the Pune area, which naturally indicates that these areas would be good for growing grapes. So they can be, they can act as a guide. So in a way, you know, in classical Indian lang in dance, one of the reasons people had to learn dance is not for dancing, but to understand dancing, because dance is like a code language where the mudras and the different forms, you need to know to appreciate. So the weeds is also like a different language. They are telling us, but we, we have to tune in to, uh, to be present and to understand that. So I wanted to bring this, you know, kind of joyful, natural learning to people in that manner, not as a, you know, you have to read this, look at that, we, we this, doing that. But how do I do that? I thought of, um, you know, I'm a ecologist, I'm a um, foodie, and I'm a doodler. So naturally, the coloring, something to do with coloring came into my mind. And I researched that Carl Jung, who is the master psychologist, had recommended coloring to his patients. And um, psychologists in Harvard Medical School consider the act of coloring something that relaxes amygdala. Amygdala is the fear center of our brain, and it actually de-stresses and makes us feel more positive. So here, here is an opportunity to use coloring as a first step that can be done indoor before one can take out, go outdoor. Outdoor, if you walk, and I personally experienced it, more I walked, more I know about them, it gave me, gave me a feeling of what the Japanese call shinrin-yoku. Shinrin-yoku is a term which means forest bathing, which is actually the feeling one absorb, you know, gets by absorbing the environment of the forest. So what it does, there are actually documented evidence that this um, shinrin-yoku actually has immense health benefits. It um, is helpful to the heart. It also relaxes people. Um, makes their anxiety less and also makes them feel positive. So, and many other benefits. So perhaps the weed that are representation of the wilderness around us and around anywhere is a, is a very ubiquitous representation that we can tap into for our own Shinriyaku. So how to bring them uh, to people? So I thought of a um, coloring book coloring book for adults. So idea was to, there will be one coloring book for edible weeds, um, followed by one on medicinal weeds and one on edible flowers. The later two hasn't come, but the edible weed book is in print, in its second print. It contains uh, 40 species, of which all are available um, in India, all, over, all around the tropics, and also in the temperate region seasonally. So. Um, when we go into, um, so w when this you know, book came out, the people, different people have started using it differently. One thing is about cooking, and one has to be 200% sure before you start cooking. But eating it is on, it's just a fringe benefit. The main work, main ac uh, act action is to know them and is to appreciate them. And the journey is much more important than what you do with it. Different people do different things. The chefs have started using it to incorporate in their food. But then there are artists who suddenly thought, wow, there are so many other 
uh, plants that are available that they didn't know, different shapes, sizes, materials. So some of them have started using in their prints, in natural dye, and in their artwork. So how you use it is really only limited by your creativity. So it can be by you know, um, food history, art, music, whatever have you. So my take home in this is um, three. One, plan your alt control Dell moment and take a day, make a date with nature once every day. It ties very well with the first speaker who says take one hour in the morning. So you know, have that one hour, the date with the nature. <laughs> so um, take a walk, do whatever it, uh, you, you, you feel like, but be, have a quiet relation with nature. Be quiet yourself such that you can be an observer. You can be in Sakshi Bhava. And number two, once you have, when you source from it, um, then I'll, I'll take, I'll finish this. When you source from it, uh, that, uh, uh, that inspiration, then try to get to that source for all your action. It's like you know, having, that, or having that wish in your pocket. Try to use that source from all your decisions from it. Decisions including what to eat or big decisions about your life. Question and question where the food is coming from, where the farm is, what the soil is. You may not get the answer, but question anyway. Number three, form a group of people who are like-minded and remain in action. Take action that actually is regenerative. Being in regenerative action, you are not only working for yourself, your family, your planet, but you are also in climate action. And all together, because you are just linked with nature. So these are my three um, take home messages. And a bird watcher is called nowadays a birder. So a weed appreciator will be called a weeder. So be a weeder. Thank you.